Hi, my name is David Burton. I work for University of Missouri Extension. I live in Republic, Missouri, and I get to share the travelogue with you this month, uh, looking at a trip that I actually took in the summer to the summer of 2021 to various places in Italy. So I've got a lot of pictures to show, and so let's just begin right away uh, with that part of the presentation. So I would have to say that Italy uh, was a bucket list item for me. Uh, I don't have many travel destinations that I've dreamed of seeing, but Italy would be number one or two on that list. And actually two years ago, I was asked to be part of a team that was going to travel to various places in Italy and develop partnerships to result in exchanges between Springfield, Missouri and various communities in Italy. Of course, that trip got delayed by COVID uh, three different times, actually. And but finally, toward the end of July 2021, we were able to go. And uh, it was a wonderful experience. And I'll just kind of kind of capture some of the highlights. This is the team that I actually traveled with uh, from left to right. It's Kelsey Clyer, Ashley Clarno, uh, Avery Muniz, Jeremy Muniz. Uh, David Burton, and Nathan Haskins. And uh, these team members will be returning in the future with different teams from Springfield, Missouri. And we're, here we are in the Vatican Square uh, on one of our last days, actually. So our trip was really a whirlwind. Uh, I actually lost eight pounds in Italy from all of the walking we did uh, as we were trying to go to all the different destinations that we would be taking future uh, teams too. So we saw some amazing sites. And for a history buff like me, this was an amazing 10 days that we got to travel from Rome to Mestra to Venice to Vasto to Bolano to Moldova to Verona to Florence and back to Rome. So we covered a lot of ground. Most days began at 7 a.m. and ended at midnight. And we averaged several different meetings during the during the day. Uh, we walked a lot. I think I mentioned that. My easy day, according to my step counter, was 18,000 steps. Uh, the most that we did in one day was 24,000 steps in Venice. Uh, that's about 10 miles, actually. So, but from ancient castles to modern trains, we saw it all. It was a great experience. So let's just begin with some of the highlights. Um, and I'll begin with the Vatican and the Vatican City Museum. Um, the, uh, this is actually one of the walls of the Vatican when, you know, it was actually a, a fortress for a while. The Pope was both a religious leader and a military, military, um, military leader <laughs> in the Middle Ages. And so the museum that we saw was uh, back behind this fortress wall. And uh, we buzzed through all sorts of amazing uh, ancient artifacts. Uh, I, things that were far beyond what I was expecting to see in the Vatican Museum. Beautiful murals and paintings and tapestries on the wall here. Ceilings that were painted that looked three-dimensional, frankly. Uh, one of the highlights for me was seeing this Babylonian scroll that is actually uh, signatured by Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, that's an amazing thing to see but lots of history all throughout Rome. It's not just in the museum at the Vatican. Uh, this is the Pantheon in Rome, built in 29 BC, and scholars still don't know what holds up the dome of that building. There's no pillars on the inside holding it up. Still not sure how they, how they did it, and it's still standing ever since 29 BC. Again, some of the Roman ruins, uh, the Forum, area actually in Rome. Uh, still lots of excavations going on, but there's all sorts of walking tours and things you can take that explain the different elements here of the forum of that uh, you can see on the far horizon where the green trees are. There's people over there looking into the forum from that, from that vantage point as well. Tours everywhere you go and amazing sights. This was one of the seventh Seven Wonders of the Ancient World. It was the tomb of Alexander the Great. 
originally had a garden on top of it. And then that the garden was removed and it was turned into sort of a uh, fortress castle for the uh, Pope, actually. Uh, there were all sorts of photo shoots, like with models and magazines taking place around that building that was interesting to, to see. And here we are in the, the square at the Vatican and uh, the famous pillars that are lined up there. The building on the top left, uh, one of those windows, I believe the second window over is one that the, the Pope often stands at and speaks from down into the square. But we were also able to tour the inside of the Basilica. It, St. Peter's Basilica is the world's largest church, the world's largest basilica. You know, to kind of give you perspective, that um, structure there in the middle, the altar, the, the brown carved wood structure, that is the same height as the Statue of Liberty. And you can see it easily fits within the dome of the Vatican. For me, it was really interesting to watch the Christmas Eve service from the Vatican this year, having been there in person and seen this. It's a it's an amazing site, an amazing historical place. And for you art lovers, uh, the, this is the Piada by Mike, Michelangelo. Many consider it his greatest work of art. And it's there uh, in the Basilica toward the rear of it. There are all sorts of amazing sculptures everywhere you go in Italy, it seems, especially in Rome and Florence. It's just, you know, this famous sculpture, sculpture this famous painting, this famous artist, um, all around you, it really is an amazing thing to witness. And then under the um, basilica is where previous popes are buried from the more recent to the very, very ancient. And it was interesting to walk through that crypt and see some of that as well. Uh, on the left, this is again is still other portions of the Roman ruins, some of which are still being uh, excavated as time and dust and dirt, you know, filled in over time. Uh, but they're doing what they can to uh, restore them and keep them upright. And then on the right is uh, another Michelangelo sculpture. It's in the little uh, out of the way cathedral there in Rome. And that is Moses in the middle. This is considered to be his second greatest sculpture piece of work. Uh, but it's in a out of the way to a little chapel that you, we would have never known anything about had it not been for the great tour guide that we uh, made connections with, Katerina. Actually, just heard from Katerina again this week. So good to stay in touch with her and hope to go back someday and maybe she can give us additional tours. And of course, the Rome, Roman Colosseum. We were not able to do a tour inside the Colosseum. Uh, the week before, they had just opened up a new area underneath the Colosseum, and it was the hot ticket. It's where everyone wanted to go. Uh, but we were able to see this Colosseum and the one in Verona, which I'll show you. And the one in Verona was built first. It was actually the model for this one in Rome. This is actually a monument to Mussolini. Uh, white marble, and uh, it's kind of more to... Italy and its veterans and things now, but it was uh, originally uh, built by and for Mussolini. So you see marks of uh, World War II around in different places like that, reminders of it. Uh, I mentioned Katerina, actually. This, uh, th this is the young lady who was our guide in Rome. We met her in Vasto when she was on vacation at the beach there, and we bumped into her, got acquainted, and then we, uh, we came back to Rome we called her up and uh, she spent most of the day giving us a fantastic tour all over Rome. Well, ancient history is everywhere you go. Um, here on the left is one of the Roman bridges into the city of Verona, uh, perhaps the gate that Paul entered through when he came through Verona, Italy. And then on the right, uh, I'm in one of the windows of a Roman bridge that still stands and crosses the river there in Verona. It's funny, as we, as we had some tour guides on some parts of our trips, I would ask about different buildings, 
because uh, we were, you know, walking fast to get from one place to the other. And it was funny. Sometimes we'd say, oh, that was just built in the 1600s. We're, we not stop there. It's not not old enough. We heard that from Katerina in Rome a lot. Oh, that's just medieval. You're not interested in that. We're going on to the ancient ruins. So it's um, it's a pretty unique place if you are a history buff. This is on a cliff up near a monastery, actually, overlooking the city of Verona. An amazing site. Um, gosh, I don't know, may, maybe my favorite city in all the stops we made. Um, yeah, I was just fascinated by the medieval roads that existed all through Verona uh, and this huge castle that surrounded the downtown inner city part of Verona. Much of the castle wall still stands. It is 10, 12 feet thick. It is an amazing piece of architecture, as you can see. And then this is the uh, Colosseum in Verona. They still do concerts and performances there. There wasn't anything going on the night we were there, but I have said many times, if I get the chance to return to Verona, I would go see a puppet show there. I mean, no matter what was playing, I would love to see it there. Uh, as the seating is still intact, and I'm sure it's a chilling place to see live performances. But you have Roman reminders all over Verona. Uh, on the left is an ancient Roman bath uh, that was excavated. They've got sort of plexiglass on the sidewalk that covers over it so you can see down into the Roman baths. And at the right is another one of the four Roman gates into Verona that still stand. Um, this is the main Roman gate uh, that historians believe this might have been the one that Paul was brought through on his way in. And those arches up above, the little windows, would have all had uh, statues of various Roman gods inside them. Again, this is all part of that same castle structure in Verona and the, the ancient bridge. It, the picture on the left, if you look, if you look at that, where the bridge goes into that sort of tower, that tower was known as the keep. It was the last stronghold for the ruling family. <coughs> Should the wall be breached, they had another building they fell back to, then they could take tunnels and, and um, bridges over here to the keep, which would be their final uh, safe place. There's uh, it's supposed to be impenetrable, uh, you know, no windows and things. But that um, thing on the side of the tower that looks like a chimney is actually for their waste disposal from the various floors. Or they might use a, a bedpan or something to go to the bathroom, and they would toss it out through that uh, chimney-looking structure. And it was actually called a crap chute. And that's where that uh, slang term actually originates from. Then, of course, the drawbridge into the castle. Uh, that's what's pictured here on the right. Again, all that in Verona. Uh, Patricia and Alexandria, uh, one of the couples that we got acquainted with there in Verona and met with them be a future contacts for us on future trips. And then Joel and Natasha showed us around Moldova and Verona and another city or two. Um, Joel is actually a uh, Native American born man, but he's been in Italy for 30 years. And Natasha uh, will be one of our Italian contacts for future trips. Their time and investment in our team was invaluable. Then we also uh, went to Florence. <coughs> we were able to score an amazing b and in downtown Florence. This is from the rooftop eating area of our B&B &B overlooking the Domo, the dome and the tower there in the center of Florence. Amazing views. Uh, this bridge, just this is so interesting. This bridge is actually designed by Michelangelo. He, he tried to do one in Venice. His uh, design was not selected. And, uh, but this design was selected 
there in Florence, and it incorporates apartments and businesses into the bridge itself. So it's more than just a way to, for people and traffic to move. It also allowed for commerce and the renting of apartments. One thing about the Italians, especially in Florence and Venice, they were always looking for a way to make a buck. And nothing wrong with that at all, but you see that in their designs and ideas. They wanna make use of that space to be able to sell things. Again, all over Florence, you're reminded uh, of the great art history that exists there. Uh, during, you know, during the Renaissance. And then you're also reminded of uh, World War II in some ways and the conquest that take place. Again, this is in Florence on the right. That building, that white area is actually the Venice lion, the Venetian lion. So Florence was actually conquered by the Venetians. When they did that, they would leave lots of reminders of the rule around the city and relief and statues of the Venetian lion. And then when the Germans uh, took over part of the area, they came through and sandblasted the Venetian lions uh, out to a point they couldn't be recognized. So we're reminded of that. Again, uh, art in Florence, this is the statue David on the left. And on the right is sort of a uh, uh, practice sculpture by Michelangelo. This is when he, he was developing his ideas for the final piata that would be in the Vatican. There's three of these in there. They're not, you know, fully finished out of slabs of marble, but he was working on the ideas. The statue of David really is amazing, just the sheer size of it. It was out of one block of marble. Uh, the people in Florence really felt like it was... Uh, uh, an impossible task, and it was kind of a contest that Michelangelo won and developed what many would say is the finest sculpture of all time. Uh, John Luca uh, and his uh, wife were our main contacts in Florence, uh, Sonia. And we'll be working with them again on future trips into the northern parts of Italy. They uh, were both educated in the United States, and they speak really great English, and that sure makes uh, the trip and the different things you're doing with them even more enjoyable. We did actually travel all the way to the north end of Italy. Uh, we stopped in a town of Belluno, um, and actually it's the last Italian city there before you cross over into the Swiss Alps. And you can see in the picture at the left, the Swiss Alps in the horizon. Uh, but again, just these ancient cities and walkways really um, appeal to me. They're just, they're beautiful. They're so unlike anything that we see in this area. And then to have the Swiss Alps in the background, it's a beautiful, beautiful setting. And there are reminders of the war uh, around this city, places you go. And there's even reminders of the medieval period. Every city seems to have its castle, and many of them maintain the gates like we have here in Belluno, uh, part of the walking structure, part of the history. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, the gentleman in the middle, uh, Tomas Angeli, and on the left, Gabriel was our translator. Uh, they'll be one of our future contacts and people we work with on future group trips to Belluno. And then Venice. When we got off the train for Venice. This was the first sight I saw. And I will admit, this old country boy cried. I've seen this picture type of before on TV and other things and just never dreamed it would be something that I could see in person. And it is as breathtaking and amazing as you think it would be. Um, from the gondola pilots that you see in the bottom right corner to just the size of the waterways and the ancient structures. It was an amazing day to walk around Venice. Uh, we're actually on the roof of 
St. Mark's, the uh, cathedral there in Venice, the ancient cathedral in Venice, and the Roman horses on the outside. Interesting, they, the Venetians conquered so many different areas. They brought back all sorts of bounty from different cities. And you see that incorporated here in the cathedral. It's sort of a, a Greek Byzantine architecture, but you've got Roman statues and things throughout. They've plundered and, and brought back. Uh, there's the whole story about them bringing back the body of St. Mark, and he's buried under the altar there. It's um, just fascinating stories abound. I already mentioned the gondola pilot, but again, this is the Rialto Bridge, and it's another one of those designs. This is the one that Michelangelo did not get picked for, but you can see how it incorporates walkways with uh, shops on the bridge, and those shops are still operational now. Uh, this is a view from St. Mark's uh, rooftop into the plaza there in Venice. Amazing site, first century libraries, other, other things all around that area. This is the inside of the cathedral. It's the largest um, mosaics in the world. I mean, the whole roof and walls were all mosaics. And those are gold tiles that are used. And you can see sort of the Greek Byzantine influence in the uh, art and the architecture. This is actually the first uh, bridge and archway in Venice uh, on one of the side islands that we went to see. We went there mainly because of an ancient church that was there, first century church, actually. And at the rear of the church is this huge mosaic depicting end times. Um, individuals on the left side of the mosaic are faring uh, much better. Going to heaven, those on the right at the bottom, that is in hell. So it's it's pretty a uh, graphic mosaic. <laughs> uh, think about turning around at the end of a church service and leaving it out, looking at that. It would be quite a powerful reminder. But again, this is a first century uh, church there. Well, Venice is all about commerce, markets, pasta, vegetables, anything you can think of. That's that's today. And it's always been that way. This square right here is where banking and insurance were invented, as well as ledger book accounting. Venetians loaned, started loaning money. They let people buy shares on ships and vessels and, and share in the profits that were made. They, they sold, developed a way you could buy, buy insurance to ensure that your boat would get back. And if not, you'd be paid. <clears throat> that was all created and invented right here in this square. And under each one of those arches, a different banking family from Venice would have their table, their store, their bank. And that's where commerce really took place. So uh, Jeremy on our team had been to Venice several times before. But we did so much walking that day in turns that we ended up in some places that he'd never even seen before. Uh, this is one of those areas more on the southern end of Venice. But again, lots of little cafes and waterways, and <clears throat> you can see his excitement about seeing a new section of Venice that he hadn't seen before. <clears throat> so part of our visit to Italy was for setting up these amazing uh, future exchange trips that we'll be taking. And certainly Venice and Rome and the medieval castles were all amazing. But the people that we met and interacted with really made the trip more meaningful. It, these are people we'd be working on future endeavors with. Um, Paula, Paula Del Lino, uh, lives there in Vasto. She's going to be the lo local coordinator for our youth exchange. We'll be partnering and working with her and some others on a sports camp there in Vasto. And Vasto is just like all the other Italian towns. There's an ancient castle in the middle. This one has a moat around it. It doesn't have a big wall for the whole city, but the ruling family was certainly protected. But Vasto has something else. It has some beautiful vistas 
is ha it has what the Italians say is the most beautiful beach in all of Italy. We didn't go down to the beach, but from the vistas that we had, it was beautiful. It has its own history. Uh, this is actually a mummified uh, saint in the base in the bottom portion of one of the uh, cathedrals we visited there in Vasto. Uh, I won't go into the history on on him, but it's just fascinating to me that they have mummies uh, inside the churches. Uh, our host family, my host family that I stayed with on the left, uh, Alessandria and uh, Ilias. Uh, he is a soccer coach. They were so gracious, welcomed us into their uh, apartment home. And then we met with a group of people there in Vasto one evening for a dinner. Had a big potluck for us. You know, I was thinking, oh, Italian potluck. I had my own ideas of what that was going to be. And as the food kept being brought in and put on a table, I thought I took a picture thinking, I don't know what any of this is. Not, none of this looks like Olive Garden. So <laughs> uh, depending on the region you're at uh, in Italy, your foods will be different. There are big regional differences. And here in Vasto, with them being along the ocean, uh, they have more seafood, but it's certainly more overall, more of a Mediterranean type of uh, eating type of food. Uh, Rome is where you have some more of your pastas, but uh, Vasto was very much Mediterranean. And then we uh, took a big group picture at the end of the potluck with some Italian wedding cake that someone had, had made. And then uh, as the story goes, after the picture was taken, the kissing began. Uh, <laughs> they were so happy to have us there. We did have a great time. The people are what make that trip so much fun. But the people on the trip were laughing about all the older women that were kissing me. And so by the time we got back to Springfield, a friend had already made <clears throat> a shirt for me to commemorate my trip and a reminder that I am an Italian chick magnet, but apparently only for the 65 and over crowd. <laughs> well, uh, the apartment, that's one of the apartments that we stayed in. Their living quarters are small. Um, in general, there, the Italians seem to be kind of a smaller people. And we talked a lot about knowing neighbors. Uh, that's why I visited with a lot of people about no matter, this is important, no matter where you live or travel. And uh, so you wouldn't be surprised to know that when you travel with me, the topic of neighboring comes up. And the loneliness of COVID has been hard on the Italians. One gentleman confirmed with me the national news reports that Italians living in the city really did stand or sit out on their patios and sing and play music during the COVID lockdown. That really did happen. I saw a story about that in the Associated Press. Uh, what he said to me was playing the music was a way to have connections. Um, another individual told me that he was tired of staying inside and playing his guitar alone. So he went outside and played on the patio. And I asked him, so did that mean it helped you meet your immediate neighbors? And they both said, no, not really. I just think the need to connect is part of the Italian DNA. But much like here in the United States, it may be part of their DNA to make connections, but lives have become so busied and hurried and other things have taken priority like indoor entertainment and electronics that they haven't done a real good job of making those neighbor connections and relationship. We see that here in America as well. It's led to loneliness and isolation. And those things are unhealthy for our community. Uh, in fact, one of the individuals we visited his home, uh, he told us, uh, I asked if he had contact with his neighbors. And he said, I, I don't even know what their names are. So you think of Italians as being these out, outgoing and they and they were and happy. I mean, we heard lots of laughter and it just it was contagious. And I know COVID had been difficult on them as well, but they have a lot of the same characteristics going on there as we do in the United States and not making that 
neighbor connections. People drive home. In fact, the gentleman in this house that we visited said, I drive home from work. I drive my car in the garage. I go inside and I stay. So he admitted to not even knowing the names of his neighbors. And you can see when you're living in taller structures like this, it, it, there are challenges uh, to that. But apathy toward our neighbors is actually the opposite of loving our neighbors. And while you may have friends elsewhere, isolating yourself does not build the community. Uh, my experience is that having just one neighborhood spark plug can make all the difference. And so that might perhaps be a challenge to you to take this time to make connections in your own neighborhood. Uh, borrow something from them, take some food to them, uh, have a gathering, write a, a card of thanks or encouragement to them. Uh, this is one of the best things you can do for yourself and for your community, especially uh, with those living close around you. Uh, I had kind of encouraged Alexandria and Ilias about this when I was there and staying in their apartment. And they contacted me several weeks later saying, you know, we heard what you said, and uh, we took some food over to one of our older neighbors that we see in the garden sometime, but we don't know her name. And we end up having her over for dinner and having a nice visit. And I think we'll do more of this in the future. So it's an important thing. And I try to encourage Italians on that. And I want to encourage you on this video as well. Italy was an amazing place. And uh, the view up these steps is something I thought about a lot in Italy. I, I was normally walking toward the rear of my group <laughs> and trying to catch up <laughs> from the back. And it seemed like there were steps everywhere. A few days I was even thinking, <laughs> will we ever get there? But we always did, and good things always resulted. But we had to put in the work. And that's what this trip was about. It was about forging those relationships so even better future work can occur in exchanges between Springfield and these areas of uh, Italy. I get asked about the food a lot. So I'm going to showcase some, some of that. Again, big regional differences. Uh, this is in Rome where we had some noodles. That's always a side dish. Pasta is a side dish, not the main dish. Um, this was a veal, uh, an eggplant parmesan, I'm sorry, an eggplant parmesan on the right. That meal was in Rome. This was in um, uh, Verona. And, and the dish on the left is a uh, kind of like a pounded pork, like a chicken fried steak kind of that we might call it, smothered in tomatoes with a pasta and it has some ham in it on the right that someone else had had. We, uh, you have to order water and don't bring it to your table. And so we drank lots of bottled water. You can get it with gas or without gas. So it's sparkling or, or not. And then gelato, uh, we did have some good gelato in Italy. And as the one on the right here will attest, that's in Florence. And one of our meals, I believe this also is in Verona, uh, one of our friends on the trip actually ordered donkey. And that's what that is on the right. With this sort of bread, it's sort of a cornmeal type of item. It's not, frankly, it's not as good as cornbread, but that's what it's kind of like. And this was like a chicken fried steak, again, smothered in tomatoes and feta and spinach. They do love their vegetables. And then in Moldova, this was a ravioli with pumpkin on the inside of it. That was kind of their specialty, what they were known for in that uh, part of Italy. And they do love their pastries as well. Pizza, we did manage to find some pizza. It was a little harder than you might think. And when it arrived, it wasn't, of course, uh, like American pizza at all. I'd say the one on the left was the closest thing we had to an American pizza uh, cooked in an oven. But lots of times, you know, they were uh, pretty light on the sauce and uh, uh, just different ingredients than what we're used to in America. <coughs> lots of farmers markets. We really enjoyed uh, this part in some of the towns and areas that we visited. 
And then in uh, Venice, we actually sat down and did what they call like a four course meal. You have a, an appetizer, which was bread and some uh, tomato with spices on it. And then the second course was a fried fish. There's several different fishes there, including a squid uh, and some sardines, which were interesting. And, and then a, a, a pasta dish that had some shellfish in it, uh, which was all really very good. And then a dessert to end. That's like a big Italian meal there. Uh, we only did that once. Most of the time we would just pick one, one dish in order. And uh, a breakfast on the right, uh, and the way things are kind of separate out and presented, I thought it was colorful. And then quite frankly, on the left, my very favorite Italian thing, tiramisu. And we had several different varieties, uh, done several different ways. It was all good. Uh, this is another island off of Venice, uh, where we actually had one of those meals. It's been updated a little bit. I just love the colors here and the and the boats that exist. This was a wonderful opportunity to visit several areas in Venice or in Italy, including Venice. I hope to be able to return someday. And as I mentioned, this team will be taking other teams from Springfield to various parts of Italy, a, a youth team that's gonna be going, a, uh, a team that will be going up to the Northern parts doing music uh, gatherings, and perhaps an exchange back to the Springfield. And then uh, a team that I hope to be working on in the future will be to Florence for leadership training and development in that area. So I appreciate the opportunity to share I know this has been a lengthy travel log. Italy is a wonderful, wonderful place. If you ever have a chance to go, I would sure recommend it.